Lord Jesus Christ, you reign glorious with the angels in heaven. Send them also to earth to help us, that we may be defended and led to know you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. St. Michael and all angels, today is our namesake day, our patronal festival, coming as it does every year in the fall. And uh, I happen to think it's a really snazzy holy day. I rather enjoy St. Michael's day. Um, my friends want to know how I got a church with the same name as me. <laughs> You know, people do this double take when I get my business card. Oh, oh, you're Michael. Oh, and the church is Michael. <laughs> I'm tempted to say, but then I know it would not be fair to say, well, you know, they decided to name the church after me when they called me as pastor. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have to, these things can get back to the wrong people, so I decided to say that. But uh, yes, it is kind of my day as well, and so I take <laughs> I take unabashed joy in that, but it is our day, too, as a congregation, to recognize uh, the glory of the saints for which we are named and the angels and archangels of heaven. If Trinity is a celebration of a theological concept, then uh, St. Michael's Day, or the celebration of angels, then is a celebration of what I would call particles of energy particles of energy, and I'll get to that a little later in this sermon. But if we can have Trinity someday, I think we can have Michaelmas someday, Michael's Mass. Those ideas are related in many ways, the idea of the Trinity and the idea of angels, who, after all, are God's messengers. Angels come from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. And more often than not, when the angels and archangels mix it up with us humans, and those are the only two of the nine order of angels that do that, they are communicating God's thoughts to us, and perhaps sometimes our thoughts back to God. They are bodiless most of the time, beings of intelligence, these particles, as it were, that defy time and space, but that by their definition will always and always be with us as God talks to us. The Protestant reformers kept St. Michael and All Angels Day on the calendar. They pretty much gave the heave to all saints that weren't specifically biblical or mentioned figures, but Michael is in scripture, along with Gabriel and Uriel and Raphael, who heard them in the first hymn. And Michaelmas, in particular, it is and was very popular in England as a festival day. It comes uh, generally a uh, fixed day, September 29th. So it comes close enough to the equinox that it marks the beginning of fall. And so schools reopen, and the law courts reopen, the universities reopen, and it's marked Michaelmas term, is sometimes the word for this. Our U.S. Supreme Court, you'll be interested to know, maintains that tradition. Their first day is the first Monday in October, closest to St. Michael's Day. Michael appears very prominently in the book of Revelation, which we heard this morning so well read. And Michael uh, has similarities to George, both of whom are on either side of your altar, you might be inclined to know. Michael on the left, George on the right. My other church was St. George's, so <laughs> there's a reason for all of this, you see. Um, both of whose saints were very popular after World War II, and I think we'll put that together as the sermon goes on. And they're both depicted kind of conquering evil with force, and they're both sometimes depicted over dragons. But St. Michael has one special symbol, and way in the bottom of the window, which you might have to come up and see, are scales. Michael is borrowed from the Egyptian god who balanced the souls on their way to either heaven or hell, and so his symbol is the scales, weighing the lives of the righteous as he takes souls to heaven. And heaven is where, of course, he starts, and he cleans it up. 
as we heard in the book of Revelation. Hard to believe there'd be war in heaven, but there was. And Michael separates the good angels from the bad ones, and the only place for the bad ones, unfortunately, is earth. It's the only other place they can go. His name means, who is like God in Hebrew? But it's a question, not a statement. Who is like God? And of course, the answer is, only God is like God, which is Michael's mission. So Michael needs to continue his work not only in heaven but on earth by defending us, fighting for us, protecting us, because he has set boundaries around evil. Evil will not triumph over good, nor will it be victorious over God. And that is what Michael constantly reminds us of. Theologians in general and physicists in particular, have taught us a lot about angels. Now, on the theological side, they appear in the Nicene Creed, where they are referenced as part of God's created order. All things seen and unseen, exactly. The nod to angels, that God could have beings, created things around God that can't be seen, but whose effects can be measured and felt. 99% of the time, the angels do their work invisibly, by intuition, by inspiration, by suggestion, by thought. You know when you have that sudden inner voice that tells you to call someone, or to do something, or you happen to be, as you might think, in the right place at the right time, you greet someone you haven't seen in a long time, or you're brought together with someone that needs a word of hope or healing, those are times when angels, particles of thought, have entered into our lives. Those sudden ideas, those inspirations, answers to prayer, the boundless capacity of God to talk with us, perhaps when we least expect God to do so. Now you're thinking, hmm, how do physicists have anything to teach us about angels? Well, physics has a parallel way of showing us about the created world and its unseen qualities. I don't think you have to be a physicist and sign on to the Nicene Creed to believe that there are things seen and unseen in the world. There are four fundamental forces of nature which are known to us, some of them known for many, many years, indeed millennium, and some known recently. Gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. As much as can be understood about these forces, and there is a lot to discover, for example, what exactly is gravity, and why does it exist? For example, that and others, all of those are the result, of most physicists agree, of particles. Not necessarily of matter, but very likely of energy. And in nearly all cases, they can't be seen until their effects can be measured. Do you recall the search for the Higgs boson, which the Hadron Collider was finally able to prove existed? It had been named the God particle by the physicist who postulated it existed. But he didn't exactly call it the God particle. He called it something a little shorter, the GD particle, <laughs> because he was so frustrated in his efforts to prove it existed when not a trace of it could be seen until the Hadron Collider brought its effects and made it. Subatomic particles were not known to exist 100 years ago. There's a famous physics book which says, now that the atom has been discovered, the case is closed, and we know everything about the universe that we need to know. And now we know a lot more. The strong nuclear force is 6,000 trillion, trillion, trillion times greater than Earth. Force that binds molecules in atoms is phenomenally strong. Einstein figured that out. And we were yet to see it when the atom could be 
really sweat for the enormous amount of power that is released. Despite that, the forces of gravity keep us seated here in church so we don't fly off into space. Except when you're singing the glorious hymn, and then maybe you start levitating a bit. But gravity keeps us here. What is gravity, and why do we stay put? These particles provide electricity, which keeps the lights on in our bodies moving, and they bind atoms into a coherent matter, and yet we know so little about them. So if particles can't be seen, but their effects measured, so too with angels who do their best work behind the scenes, quietly, but if necessary can assume bodily form. They can work through us to aid and assist God's people. It is not theologically true, strictly speaking, that we become angels when we get to heaven, although we often use that kind of language to describe paradise. But it is true that angels can become like us, part of us to help and defend others here on earth. So let me tell you a story I heard recently about an angel appearing. And this comes um, from a parishioner. Now, I don't have permission to tell the story, so this person will have to remain anonymous for now. But trust me, uh, this is a verifiable source for this information. Uh, I'm not making this up. It was a beautiful story, and an angel appeared. This person had been traveling uh, up through Vermont into Quebec on a business trip, and because of the time, it arrived at night. And I don't know if those of you have been in Quebec uh, through the back roads on your way up there, but uh, there are a lot of them, and it's very dark, and it can be very confusing at night. And so after several, uh, quite a bit of time being lost on back roads, it was just darker still and more lost still and more confusing still. No GPS and maybe it wouldn't even have worked had there been one. But at any rate, suddenly she came to this small village, seemingly in the middle of nowhere, and made the more so because of the darkness. And she is scared and she's wondering where she is and where she, how can she get where she needs to be. And there is a small gas station with a light on and a young man sitting at a desk reading the book. <laughs> so she gets out and goes in. And it turns out this young man was learning English. So between the parishioners somewhat French and this young man's somewhat English, introductions were made. And he understood what the problem was and was able to sketch out and guide her where she needed to be and how she could get there and wish her the best and sent her off. I'm not sure if a little gas was involved, but that might have been part of the story. I can't recall. But nonetheless, he rescued her in the middle of nowhere. And I was waiting as the story was going along, and then, then it came to be. And she said, my person said, I felt he was an angel. It was like he was sent to be there that night at that time to help me out. And he could not have been nicer, and he couldn't have been more of a rescuer at that point in that night. And I have never forgotten him. So we celebrate the wonder and mystery of angels, God's secret agents, those particles of pure energy they are filling this room right now with their enthusiasm. They are filling our hearts with joy and hope and strength. I think we all have angel stories where people have come to us and assisted us in ways we never expected or thought possible. And we can be like them too. That is the good news. We can be messengers of peace and life bearers of God's presence, bringers of hope and healing. Things seen and unseen that can be shared not only with us, but shared with all of God's people. So let us be angels this day. And let us be angels all the days of our lives through Jesus Christ our